Welcome to Talking Out Your Glass. I'm Sean Wagoner. Equal parts artist, scientist, and historian, Fritz Dreisbach has spent the last five decades teaching and demonstrating glass blowing around the world. This Johnny Appleseed of glass has himself played a vital role in the history of the American studio glass movement that he now strives to preserve and share with the next generation of artists. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, Dreisbach grew up in Akron as part of a family of educators. His father, a college chemistry professor, and mother, a high school music and literature teacher, created in their son what is referred to as conciatore, a marriage of art and science. Dreisbach holds two bachelor degrees, one in art and one in math. This duality is reflected in both his technical consulting for glass factories, such as the Glass Eye Studio, Spectrum Glass, Kugler Colors, and Seattle Batch, as well as his continuing personal journey to express using hot glass. Dreisbach studied painting and sculpture at the University of Iowa, earning his MA. Planning to eventually teach painting, his advisor instructed him to study a broad range of artistic subjects. A two-credit course in glassblowing was part of the curriculum, and serendipitously, his love affair with glass began. Dreisbach continued his studies at the University of Wisconsin, where he earned an MFA and was inspired by three pioneers of the studio glass movement, Harvey Littleton, Dominic Labino, and Erwin Eich. His education includes a hefty dose of art history, including ancient, Renaissance, and 20th century painting and sculpture. His background in painting and classical intaglio printmaking provides the basis for practical color theory. When the excitement of working with hot glass spread from the University of Wisconsin, no one traveled farther or more frequently than Dreisbach to proselytize about glass blowing. The artist visited the first summer session held at the Pilchuck Glass School in 1971 and has been active with the school for more than 40 years as teacher, advisor, and trustee. He also helped found the Glass Art Society, which presented him with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2002. My conversation with Fritz Dreisbach begins with him discussing his family history and the important role teaching played from his earliest beginnings. I grew up in Akron, Ohio. My parents were both teachers. Um, my Aunt Eleanor, who lived across the street and functioned as a second mother for us, for my two brothers and myself, was also a teacher. She taught in a one-room schoolhouse in West Virginia, sixth grades. And my mother's father, my grandpa, was a college professor also, like my father. So there are a lot of teachers in our family, and I enjoyed hearing their stories. And I learned a lot about what the teaching profession entails. So I decided fairly early on, I would say somewhere in probably in high school, but certainly by the time I got to college, that I wanted to be a teacher. I just didn't know what I would teach. Now, the two areas of uh, expertise, I guess you might say, were uh, mathematics and art. And I did four years of high school art and math. And then I did uh, two, uh, two bachelor's degrees, one in art and another one in mathematics. My father was a scientist. My mother was a musician. And, and uh, so I had that duality in my background. How did you discover glass? Oh, that happened uh, when I got to graduate school. I was studying painting, and my painting professor uh, was preparing to leave for the summer and helped me figure out my summer schedule. And he noticed that I was uh, two credits short in my... uh, proposal and that I needed to have another class that was two credits. And they had that summer, 1964, at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, the second experimental glass blowing class in the United States. And he said, here, take that. And I said, what is it? He said, it doesn't matter. It's two credits. And that was how I got in the class, literally an accident. And then I I just took off with glass uh, and and have never looked back, really, never been able to 
to stop doing it. When and where did you teach your first glass blowing class? I taught my first class was in 1966 at uh, Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And the uh, person that set it up was the ceramics. A lot of the people that were in the earliest years of, of the glass activity in America uh, that we call studio glass today um, started in the ceramic world. And there was there were reasons for that. There was a carryover from their skills that, that they had learned about burners and about clay bodies and bricks and all that kind of stuff. All carried over to the glass and, and helped. Uh, I did not have experience in, in ceramics. I, I took one class and was forbidden to ever take another ceramics class the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the ceramics guy that at, at Ohio University in Athens, who hired me uh, for that summer class, was Henry Lynn. Uh, and his daughter is an uh, uh, environmental sculptor, Maya Lynn. So you started teaching all around the country. That became... And that's right. I, I, some people um, said that I could never hold a teaching job <laughs> because I kept moving around, but actually it was mostly due to my choice. Um, I liked the idea of that I had read about uh, the itinerant glass blowers in the, in the uh, 17th and 18th century in America. They would move from factory to factory and, and uh, take their skills uh, and pass them on to other people. And I thought that was a really cool way to live and I enjoyed travel. And so I traveled from school to school and I would learn tricks at one place and I would make them a part of my repertoire and then take those to the next school and pass them on. And that's how that moniker of uh, Johnny Appleseed of Glass uh, was bestowed upon me. Do you remember who called you that the first time? No, I tried to figure that out. I tried, to, I did study on it and I, I really don't know, but the first one, the earliest use of it in print that I could find was uh, the magazine called The Gather. It's produced by the Corning uh, Museum of Glass and they did an article I don't know, for, uh, in 04, I think that's the first time I saw it in print. So how did people teaching and taking workshops nationwide affect the studio glass movement? Well, we were very tiny. Uh, there were very few glass people in the early 60s, middle 60s, and even into the late 60s. There were only a handful of people blowing glass, trying to to struggling to get this thing going. And one of the things we just instinctively, I, I think it was an instinct that we had, that we wanted to get more people involved, was to, to spread the gospel, was to get people going. And uh, one of the best ways to do that was to do workshops. And so a lot of my friends and, and, and myself included, would go to other schools and, and do workshops. And in many, many cases, the school wouldn't have enough money to pay us. So we would trade workshops. So I would do one for Henry in uh, Ohio, and then Henry would come and do one for me, and, then, and, and so on. And instead of ex paying each of us, we did it sort of free because we knew that was the way we were going to get more people excited about glass. And we had a good role model. The ceramics artists in, in America were doing tons of workshops and demos and lectures and, and traveling around the world. And they had collectors who were buying their work and they had major exhibitions and, and museum shows. And those were all things that we as glass people, young, beginning glass people, we all wanted that. We wanted to have those uh, advantages. But before 1962, there was no 
activity in this in this glass world. The, the only artists working with glass were a few isolated examples of people uh, mostly doing fusing and slumping. In terms of your personal work with glass, what were these early days about for you? My constant activity was research, trying to figure out how to do things, how to make stuff. We didn't have any good role models that are so obvious in, in today's world, in the, in the, in the teens, the 20 teens. <laughs> we have lots of people that, that you can go watch and, and, uh, and we have uh, computer uh, programs and, and we have uh, movies from YouTube and so on and so on where you can actually see how a person holds a tool and how they touch the glass and what they do. We didn't. So everything was experiment, experiment, experiment. And that's what I spent most of my time. Some of my time I spent reading about glass. And one of the things that I know we're going to get to, it it has to do with my interest in the color that glass made. And I told you that when I was in Iowa City, I was studying painting and so I had a lot of interest in, in beautiful colors and, and how to um, combine colors to get certain effects uh, using uh, the contrasting colors of, of the complementaries as well as the uh, intermediates and uh, other combinations. So it was logical for me to, to carry that color interest over into my glass activity. And I tried to understand the chemistry and physics of glass so that I could make some interesting colors. In the earliest years, we had mostly brown. We had greenish brown and we had bluish brown and we had yellowish brown. But they were all browns. <laughs> I think they came from the ceramics world. <laughs> and uh, Not the prettiest colors. Not, not the prettiest colors. <laughs> on there. Yeah. So you've said that your three biggest influences were Harvey Littleton, Dominic Labino, and Erwin Eich. Can you talk a little bit about each one of those people and how they influenced you? Yeah. Um, I I met all three of them, again, totally by accident. This was nothing planned whatsoever on my part. I met them the summer of 64, that first summer that I started blowing glass. Littleton came down to do a workshop at Iowa for our class, which was taught by Tom McLaughlin, one of Harvey's former ceramic students. Uh, And McLaughlin lived in Iowa, not in Iowa City, but nearby, an hour away. So Harvey brought Erwin Eich, who was visiting Harvey up in Madison, Wisconsin, down to do a workshop so I met those two guys there at the, the school studio. And they were there for a few days. And it, it was really a, a, a great experience. And I, I realized then how important Littleton was to setting up this glass activity that I was now a part of. And Aish was a, a role model because he was a trained artist. He studied painting and sculpture in the art school in Munich, uh, Germany. And his family owned a glass factory, so so Erwin had access to uh, hot glass. Uh, He didn't have to uh, invent a a new furnace design. There was hot glass there. However, he did, after a short period of time of working in the big factory furnaces. He did build his own furnace down the basement of the factory. Anyhow, that was a a good and important uh, step. Littleton, of course, as I said, is credited with having uh, the inspiration to to try to blow glass as an artist independent of uh, the big glass factories. He also was a person who combined art with the academic world. Yeah, he was also connected in the academic world. And I I was still interested in being, becoming a teacher. I still wanted to do that, even in in those first uh, classes in in Iowa City, that I wanted to teach. And now I was adding 
uh, glass to the painting uh, background for my teaching. And then the third person is Dominic Labino, and I met him later after my class. I drove back to Ohio to visit my mother and father who lived outside of Cleveland uh, in a little tiny town called Hiram, Ohio, uh, where there's a school that, where dad was the professor of chemistry. On the way, I stopped and visited uh, Dominic Labino. And Labino was very helpful in that first 62 workshop in March of 62. He showed up with the idea for a, a better furnace design than the one that uh, Harvey had uh, built, and also um, the glass cullet or, or um, glass particles that we put that they put in the furnace to melt down and, and blow glass um, so that they didn't have to mix batch, which was a laborious and, and uh, problematic uh, approach to making glass. Not, not the best thing for beginners. Nick had this uh, ability due to his background in glass factories around uh, the Midwest. He, he knew how to melt glass and he knew uh, what a good design for a furnace was and burners. He could design burners and annealing ovens and all of those things. And he passed all that information along to the students in the workshops in Toledo. And then it came to me. Well, it also turned out that um, by reading about the colors of glass, how to make colored glass, I, I found out that one of the issues is sometimes not only the colorant that you use, but also the base glass has to be a certain uh, type of uh, formula in order to get certain colors. And I wanted to know what the base glass was of these uh, Johns Manville 475 marble. And so I wrote to Nick and he said, yes, he knew because he had invented it. <laughs> that was his <laughs> glass. He made that glass and he knew it was perfect for the artist to use because he knew all the properties that that glass had. And uh, so I asked him, I said, I, I, I don't want any proprietary information. I'm not asking for that, but can you just tell me what family it is? He said, I'll send you the formula and you can do anything you want with it in the art world, but don't try to make fibers with it <laughs> <laughs> because you'll get sued to the... <laughs> I, I promised him I never would make a fiber. <laughs> <laughs> so part of his contribution that was so huge was that these furnaces and annealing ovens would allow artists to work with glass wherever they wanted. They could work with glass independently in their own studios. Yeah. You see, in the factory, in the big glass factory where they make milk bottles and window glass and all those other kinds of things, those furnaces were, um, would hold in, a, in the neighborhood of 100 tons of molten glass. So this is a, a furnace, the inside of which is the size of a small house. And then they had research furnaces in the laboratory where they did little melts to, to find out what would happen if they changed one ingredient for another ingredient. And those uh, were measured in grams. So they had gram-sized furnaces, in other words, about a Dixie cup full of molten glass with a platinum liner, of course. <laughs> and then they had these giant furnaces. But did they have anything in between? Well, not so much. There were very few in-between sized furnaces. But Nick had built an in-between sized furnace, I don't know, 50 to 150 pound size furnace for a company that that he was a, a very active part of called Fibers Incorporated and it was later bought by uh, Owens Corning Fiberglass and then later uh, by Johns Manville Fibers. Um, that furnace that he built there was the model that I think he must have used for uh, his furnace for blowing glass. It went all over the world, literally, that design for that furnace was used by literally, I mean this, hundreds of glassblowers 
in 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 the world, in America especially, but also it it went to other countries, and many other countries. That was a, that was a very important contribution. That furnace, the design, the idea that you could melt glass and get a reasonably good melt in the hundred pound range, plus or minus a little. That was a major major contribution. And what about Aish? What was his primary influence on you and contribution to Studio Glass? Well, okay, I, I have to back up a little bit. Now, I told you that I didn't do ceramics and I didn't do jewelry and, and things where you make containers. So when I started blowing glass, I was fascinated with the concept of making vessels, glass vessels, goblets, bowls, vases, platters, the whole gamut. And because I had never done it, it was fascinating for me and I did a lot of them. And in fact, taught myself a great deal about how to manipulate molten glass on on the blowpipe and punty by doing those things over and over and over. When I met Aish, he came from a factory where they made uh, vessels every day, all day long, functional vessels. And so when he made his artwork, he would he would take what looked like the start of a vessel and destroy it or, or change it or alter it in a way that, that became very expressive of, of, um, of modern sculpture and, and modern uh, art. And so he added that to the mix that you didn't have to keep making those functional vessels as an end product. He showed how to go beyond that. And he is a very poetic. He is a very poetic person. He he's also a painter, and he still paints uh, today, and and continues to make glass today, and has exhibitions all over the world, especially in Europe. So Littleton organized the very first glass blowing workshop held at Toledo Museum of Art in 1962. Who was there, and what was that event like? There are lists of the, the students that were there. I don't have them committed to memory. Clayton Bailey was there uh, and Tom McLaughlin, but they were all potters, I think, except maybe one or two sculptors. And they were mostly colleagues, friends of Harvey Littleton. Now, the, the way I understand the story is that Littleton asked for help, financial support to help him get glass blowing to be a, come a part of the art program at Madison, Wisconsin. He asked many people, Corning, Alfred, and one of the people he asked was Otto Whitman, who was the director at the Toledo Museum. And he knew Otto and he knew the Toledo Museum because he had actually taught adult education classes there when he was a student at uh, Cranbrook. And Otto said, well, you know, I'd like to help you. I think this is a great idea, let's, let's do this. There's no reason why if an artist or an art student can work with ceramics in their backyard and and work with jewelry uh, down in their basement and work with weaving up in the attic, why can't a glassblower do it? Why can't they work uh, outside of of the big, big factory? But I'm not going to give you money to do that up in Wisconsin. If you want to do that, you have to come here to Toledo and we'll do it here at the Toledo Museum of Art. And that literally, that decision of Otto Whitman's put Toledo on the the glass art map. And they are now credited with starting the glass movement that we know today as Studio Glass. In 1964, you started making goblets. Talk about what influenced the transition in your goblets to a more elegant object. The thing was, I went to the library immediately. We were all trained at, at Iowa City to, to uh, use the li- art library uh, as a tool, a research tool. I went to the library and, and checked out books and, and looked at uh, not only technology books that talked about the physics and chemistry and the color of glass, but also art books uh, with pictures in them. <laughs> and uh, there were these incredibly elegant, ornate Italian goblets from the 16th and 17th century. 
And I was just absolutely blown away because I had actually, by this time, I had actually dipped my blowpipe into the furnace and wound on this gooey taffy like material how in the world could they ever control that material to the extent that they could make a little tiny dragon with eyeballs and fangs and a tongue and then put a cup on top of that and then put it in the annealing oven and it would come out the next day and they could drink out of it holy moly i thought okay the goblet form kept showing up in the books as a, a good target uh, object to work on. So, I, and that's what I did. I, 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 my first goblet was actually more like a vase with a, with a clunky uh, foot and almost no stem. Over the years, I, as I, my hands developed the skills that I needed in order to control the glass a little better, I could make them a little thinner and a little more elegant. I never, ever got all the way to the primo Italian goblets. I had no idea how they could possibly ever do that. You know, it just looked like something that you'd have to do by magic. But I kept working at it. So I started my first attempts at a goblet in 64. But in uh, 1991, I finally realized that the best way that I could have obtained this kind of goblet of my own, where the influence came from the Italians, but the subject matter and the, the actual stem uh, motif was something that came from my brain. And that combination of the Italian style with my imagery uh, was realized in, in on on the week of my birthday, my 50th birthday, with Dante Marioni and Janusz Posniak, who helped me combine uh, and put together these goblets that I had in my brain, but I didn't have the skills to do it at the furnace. This wasn't the first time I had collaborated with a person who was a better glass blower than I was, but it was one of the best uh, opportunities that I've ever been given, and that was a uh, a great present from those guys. I love that whole series. That, I want all of those. Series, it's, it, you know, it's just to die for, in, in my opinion. Thanks for tuning in to part one of my interview with Fritz Dreisbach. In part two, we'll talk more about Fritz's personal work, including ceremonial vessels, mongos, goblets and trick glass, and his most current wheel engraved and cameo cut work. This episode was brought to you by Glass Patterns Quarterly, The Flow, and Glass Art Magazine. To find out more about our webinar schedule, back issues, and subscriptions, go to www.glassartmagazine.com. Look for my article on Fritz Dreisbach, which was published in the November-December 2014 issue of Glass Art Magazine. For questions or comments on this podcast, email me at editor at glassartmagazine.com. Until next time, stay glassy.